Welcome everyone to uh, this session today. We have snippets from an algorithmic trading system in Kotlin. Dananje Nin is um, going to be presenting. We're pleased to have you with us um, today. Thank you very much. Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about, I, I have been working on an algorithmic trading system. So we're going to, and that's written in Kotlin. So we're going to be taking a look at that and uh, not, not that entire trading system, but I extracted some snippets out of that and, and we're going to take a look at that and uh, take it from there. So I hope, I hope uh, you find this a uh, useful session. Uh, the talk sequence is going to be like this. I think the first two or three minutes I'm going to just spend on uh, the financial markets and derivatives on options just to give people a little bit of idea about that and why algorithmic trading. The talk itself is uh, in three areas. One is, I, I chose to just focus on three areas as opposed to the entire system. Type safety using generics, then we will look at a complex data structure, an option chain trail. And then we will be looking at uh, concurrent programming using coroutines, channels, and actors. I roughly expect each part to last about 15 minutes. So I'll, I'll spend about 12 minutes. And then from that point onwards, we'll maybe take a break after each part for Q and A and uh, then we'll move on to the next one. Now the total topic is a little content heavy, even though I kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, distill just the essential code. Uh, so that es essential code, I have pasted it and, and uh, I have the link there. It's bit.ly at fnconf hyphen algo hyphen trading. So if you want to open it up on the side, feel free to do so. If you want to look at it later, feel free to do so because I'll be highlighting the important points, but if you want to kind of, you know, get into the details of it later on, uh, that's, that's probably a place to go look at. Yeah. Okay. So first thing is about uh, financial markets. I think most of us have some sense of, I mean, you can buy a, a share at hundred rupees or hundred dollars, maybe someday later, you hope to sell it, sell it at 110, but there are more advanced, uh, uh, sort of instruments that get used called futures and options. And uh, just an important, I mean, what an option is, is I don't buy the underlying script of, let's say, Netflix. I, I don't even know what's the current price for, of Netflix in US markets, but let's just say it's $100 uh, or it's, uh, I mean, we can use an Indian one, but let's say 100 rupees. And uh, Instead of uh, investing 100 rupees, you say, I just want to buy an option. I am betting and it's a gamble. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a gamble, uh, though with a very weighted uh, risk reward, saying that 100 is going to go to 110. So I want to buy an option saying, uh, I, I, you know, I will Netflix, uh, I'll buy for 105, you know, for a, what is called the strike price of 105. And if it goes above, I'll pay five rupees for buying that option. And if it goes above 105, whatever additional money I'm, uh, you know, uh, I get in excess of 105, I'll, I'll keep it. And if it closes below 105, you know, I lose the initial money of five rupees I paid as the option strike price. So it's a bit of a, but what it gives you at the end of the day is a lot of leverage. So I might go into an option, which is expiring, let's say just four days later, I might buy it for, uh, you know, so I, in this case, I bought it for five rupees, you know, and um, that script moved from 100 to, let's say, 115. What I get at the end of the day is the difference between 115 and 105, which is 10 rupees. So on an investment of five rupees, I made a return of you know, 200 percent after four days. Now that might seem you know, to those who are not used to options very uh, incredible, uh, but that's very powerful of course, often at times. and we will take a uh, you know, small look at it. But key here is uh, the fact that it's, it's a very uh, judge, uh, you know, considered and weighted risk reward ratios people have to take when they do this trading. And it's always a game of probabilities. If you are able to work out strategies by which you will, 
let's say win 60% of the times and lose 40% of the times and you will win let's say 1.2x of what you could have on an average lose then you sort of come out better at the end of the day so and to be able to help you, a lot of people sort of do it very manually um algo has helped a lot and that is what i've been uh, uh, working on to do it in the algorithmic way sorry okay so today's talk we are going to uh, actually so this is just an example of uh, one of the nifty prices i mean uh, the other day uh, i i here didn't include the right hand side but uh, this almost tripled in price in about one and a half hours uh, i wish i had included the the so you can see at uh, 1230 it was i think at 89 and by 2 am uh, 2 pm it had uh, it had it had jumped radically so you you could have made 200% returns in 90 minutes or you could have made uh, you know just a straight 50 percent return in about 10 minutes 12 minutes that's how fast options fluctuate and which means they also tend to uh, potentially uh, you know make you lose a lot of your money and uh, most people start off losing lots of money before they start figuring out ways to make money but this is just a example of how heavily option prices fluctuate as compared to uh, normal stock prices uh another thing i have to talk about is option chain but i'll come back to this in a moment so what we are going to see now is this entire code uh, that i have shared actually i will i will use that link uh, let's see here's where we are right so in kotlin what i've done is i deal with different types of um, sort of uh, scripts so they might be spot spot as what your equities normally are indexes uh, futures and options now here's where kotlin starts uh, being helpful is in being able to come up with good ways to use generics so for example symbol usually it has a string but the symbols change in terms of the information that they need to have with them so if the an index is also a symbol but you can you can't do much with it it just got a price but if it's a tradable symbol i can trade it and if i have to trade it i can i have to know the lot size i have to know the tick size right so i can i can uh, you know start uh, distributing the class hierarchy i mean start using that in the right and the generics in the right way so i have a symbol i have a tradable symbol which has these added and uh, this spot symbol future symbol option symbol so and if you can see uh, option symbol has many many more pieces of information than just ordinary symbol because you need that uh, you know at the end of the day to uh, uh, really understand what is happening with the with the option and then what you do is you capture movements over uh let's say 1 minutes or 5 minutes or 10 minutes and we call it candles so we come up with a notion called candle and this candle will have again different information based on what is the type of script uh and it will be for a particular symbol so you could uh, usually you have open high low and close and volume but index candles for example do not have volume associated with them uh so i could then have a different interface called volume candle uh which i could then use it for everybody else but the index symbol uh, but the index candle so i can i can start having uh different types of candles and start bringing in additional attributes as necessary uh and you can see now the, the code is starting to be more and more and more uh, generic heavy right and uh yeah so you have volume candle and then some candles have what is called open interest information i think that i won't go into what that is but if they have then you know i create what is called a oi candle and i i declare each of those candles then index candle spot candle sometimes what i will do is i'll enrich the candles with um, information that's very expensive to compute so that different strategies will not attempt to recompute that at the same time one of them is what is called the implied volatility that's a very heavy mathematical equation so sometimes you know i'll add those in this case i have i think i just added a counter but uh, yeah there's a few so 
these are just examples of candles i'll i'll not go into that too much right and this is an an example of how you can take a inheritance hierarchy uh, take generics and have just the right kind of data structures uh, based on which type of symbol you are using because each different type of symbols have different characteristics and <coughs> kotlin allows you to kind of uh, really have a very sophisticated uh, uh, strongly typed system uh, which which will allow you to uh, model your uh, objects correctly in the sense if you uh, if that object constructs itself you know you you know you construct it correctly you don't have to worry about nulls and things like that um, and so that's one area where kotlin really helps you uh, so this is just how the candles and uh, uh, scripts and uh, symbols are modeled uh, i'll i'll take a pause here and let's check if we have any questions uh, before i come back to this okay we don't seem to be having any questions so i'll move on to the next step which is where things get uh, start getting a little hairy and i'll turn screen share on once again uh, there's something on chat let me see okay uh so now this is where things start getting really complicated uh we have something called option chain and this is a live option chain as of yesterday evening i should have not chosen yesterday evening because that was the time all these options expired which is why you are seeing some of these as 0.05 as the price and some but for nifty this is a snippet of of nifty as of yesterday evening you can see nifty would close somewhere between 17200 and 17250 right and uh, you had all these options with different strike prices 17200 17150 17100 on the other hand you had them for 17250 17300 17350 and on the right and left hand side are two different types of options calls and puts and again these are uh, sort of very different types of options they have very different characteristics but the key is just for nifty if i have to study how nifty is behaving i actually have to take this entire snapshot and do a lot of analysis on this to try to understand where are the opportunity areas what how nifty is likely to behave and this is a snapshot at a particular point in time now imagine um you start doing this and i i create a snapshot once every uh, minute then I, and and i store it for the last 15 minutes then i have to do a complete um you know sort of a three dimensional analysis uh, across 15 minutes so that's your that's one dimension but the two dimensions you see which is time but the two dimensions you see here are you know the strike price and the call and the puts and how they are behaving and so on and so forth so it's a very complex uh, very data heavy structure that sort of comes up and uh, the next thing we are going to take a look at is how kotlin and its um, operator functions uh, really help uh, make it very easy to work with uh, these kind of uh, uh, fairly advanced structures i think the nearest uh, that comes to my mind is uh, pandas data frame obviously it is not nowhere as flexible as that but it is uh, hopefully the the things that i i worked on make it so much easier to work with these kind of data heavy models right so this is an example of option chain and remember there is uh, you know in 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 the memory what i'm what i'm maintaining is a is a series of such option chains for just one symbol and there are literally thousands of symbols so it's it's a lot of data that sort of uh, get you know getting processed behind the scenes so yeah no, there we go so let's look at what is called the option detail option detail is just saying what is the option i am studying what is its id what expiry so an option will have multiple expiries typically 10 to 15 different types of expiries uh, dates of expiries so i know which is the one that i am studying uh then what is the minimum strike what is the maximum strike of that option because then you need uh let me go back here and show you in this case this nifty the you know all the option prices strike prices are separated by 50 rupees and uh, so in this case the span would be 50 rupees 
and the minimum and maximum strike would be a long range. In case of Nifty, it will be, let's say, from 15,000 to 25,000 rupees, right? Or um, um, 15,000 to 25,000. And uh, uh, every 50 rupees, you will have a strike uh, a option. And so it, it kind of uh, tries to capture the important information of how that option is structured. Okay. This doesn't have any runtime data. It's, it's basically uh, reflecting what are all the different types of option prices that are available with that particular option for a given expiry date. What is interesting is uh, this part, which I wanted uh, to focus on. The operator functions get help you uh, generate some very good and nice uh, access, you know, accessor functions. And I will show these to you in a moment in a test case below. So let me do a time check here. Okay. So here's my test case for option details. And I create three, I create options, a variety of options. Uh, actually, no, I, I create one option detail. And then I look at, uh, you know, how many slots it has and things like that. This I'll, I'll show you running. So let's run this code. So I have, in this particular case, I happen to be running all the uh, test cases simultaneously. So we will go look at text option details. So I say in this particular case, I have this uh, fictitious option called foo and it will have strike prices starting from 50 rupees to 100 rupees. And uh, this is just to check border conditions, but 50 rupees to 100 rupees. And uh, at, at, you know, units of 12.50. So you have, you basically have them at strike prices of 50, 62.50, 75, uh, 87.50 and uh, 100 rupees. So you'll effectively, this will create five different slots. And um, this part here, like on an option descriptor, if I, if I get it, if I give it a price, it finds me the nearest index uh, slot. Uh, which will allow me to look up that particular option details. Uh, uh, you know, it just gives you a slot number. This is used in, in subsequent code to then look up further details. But this is, uh, I, can, I can take any price and I can just give it in the operator here, uh, get operator and it will find me the nearest option, op, you know, option to that price or that strike price. And here it, it's just testing for, you know, am I even returning the right numbers? Another way I can do is I want to look at a particular strike price and I want to look at a few options above it or below it or just on one side of it, either all lesser than or greater than. Then what I can do is I can, I can de declare operator functions like this. I can say what is the type of slice I want, what is the starting price, and if I in this particular case, what I've highlighted is everything less than 70. So it will give me, uh, if I give it, it tells me I have to look at in the array, eventually uh, slots number two, one and zero. But if it is greater than I want to use two, three and four. Uh, so if these are all different type of, you know, a very different way of accessing what are frequently used uh, mechanisms to sort of subset uh, an entire option chain. And, and th this kind of uh, operator functions really make it very easy and useful to then uh, quickly narrow down the subset. Uh, the, the whole data is stored in an array. Uh, so these give you the array offsets very readily, which this particular class called option chain then uh, uses uh, very well. Uh, I won't go into the details of option chain right now, but I will show you how it gets used in um, a test case. So here is just a simple option chain construction. Uh, so here it showed me, this was a poor man's implementation of a uh, option chain printout, which is what you were seeing here, right? So if I want to print it out, I can, I can get to see an option chain very easily. Um, then you start, you know, uh, figuring out important ways to access uh, the option change along certain dimensions. As we saw, it's a three-dimensional array really. Uh, and sometimes you want to cut across time. Sometimes you want to cut across uh, different strike prices at the same time. And you can, uh, I think Kotlin really gives you a good uh, 
set of capabilities to be able to structure your your uh, functions uh, just right so here i am saying for this operation um, you know give me the pcr pcr is a domain term called put call ratio so i want to compute the total number of the ratio of the total puts and total calls and there is a whole bunch of stuff about you know how to interpret that which is kind of separate but let's go here to this function so, and here i can say get puts and so, you know map not null because sometimes you can get a null though most of the times you will never get a null but you just want to make sure you ignore a null if it comes uh you do a sum of all the open interests uh, for those puts and convert them into a float similarly take all the calls uh and create a from the calls extract the oi which is the open interest and sum them across all different strikes and divide one by the other you get a put call ratio similarly you have things like coi which is combined open interest where i can say for a particular uh, price right uh, and a particular style of slicing it uh, i mean around it when i what you are interested in is right now the price is 37 what is the what are the five strikes just around 37 two before two after and one that you know nearest and take them all and then add up the open interest so when you want when you do that again you can the slice operator is again a helpful operator that i wrote here uh, and then you can you know do all the operations on it using you know essentially sum or whatever you'll consistently see map not null but that's just because i have to uh, deal with the occasional possibility that sometimes some of them may be nulls i i my internet connection might be might have problems or whatever so it just so that the code doesn't break completely uh so you can this is again a lot of capabilities you get to be able to structure your uh code in in such a accessible way and when you put it together like this uh you get a lot of capabilities to to really be able to write functions very succinctly so here i am saying you know for a particular option for a put uh around the price of 250 five uh, is the span so it, here two before two after and one nearest to 250 and add up their put oi and give me that and the uh, test case is the expected value happens to be 245 so that's one way to kind of uh, you know do that sometimes you just want to look at the greater than i mean just one side of the price uh, depending on what analysis you are doing so on option chain uh, you can you can build a whole range of this kind of capabilities and finally option trail is a term i came up with which is an array of option chains over time and uh, again i won't go into the code in detail but we will look at in the test case how it gets used i have only one example there uh, which is to say if i have option trail i want the last uh, i want the last three uh, time stamps so let's say right now one minute ago and the one before the, that i want to extract all the calls and on each of those calls i want to compute the coi and give me the list right and and i'm saying okay in this case i expect the values to be 386 399 and 412 now there's a lot of intelligence you can do apply to try to understand is this bearish is this bullish what is the current trend and stuff like that but the interesting thing here is again i was able to uh, kind of very succinctly create a, a, a mechanism to extract the right kind of information i want so it's it for those who have of you who are familiar with pandas data frame this is somewhat uh, very crudely similar but uh, i think the the one of the things that kotlin really helped me do was uh, be able to write functions which are very easy to understand and one doesn't get bogged down in the details of uh, you know how how some of these access uh, data access really works so that is how uh, you know uh, you can take fairly sophisticated and large data structures and yet do flexible analysis at run time uh, and fairly rapidly i must say i you know literally end up recalculating the market every uh, you know few seconds uh, and 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 that's uh, that's a lot of work so 
uh, this is this is very helpful and and if i if i done it in a different language uh, some of them would have resulted in much much larger pieces of code and much uh, with you know so much more uh, you know uh, accidental complexity in them uh, than what kotlin allows me to get away with so that that was something very pleasant here so yeah so this is my this concludes the second part let me see if there are any questions now is a good time to ask any questions if you have any the third part we are going to get into is really the actors and concurrency there's there's no questions at the moment uh, sorry no questions yeah, there's, at the no, there's right. no questions right okay okay so this was the other part and the third part is the core routines and and here's where we will take a look at you know what does it take to sometimes build uh, algorithmic trading systems in terms of the architecture and here i've kind of uh, you know a relatively simple one uh, model i've created what you do is you get from a exchange data feed you get uh, from a you get a exchange data feed from a data feed vendor and you 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 get like i don't know 500000 uh ticks every second and then what you do is you try to break them and combine them into candles which you might depending on how you want to trade group it every 15 seconds one minute 5 minutes sometimes even hours uh and then you know turn out and spit out those candles and those in turn go to your strategies now any any algorithmic trader would actually focus a lot of time in the strategies but that's the one thing that i have kind of completely bypassed here uh, because that gets into a very very financial domain but what is important is all the strategies are doing their own stuff almost independently but you need to be keeping track of a lot of stuff simultaneously and a lot of this communication is asynchronous so so a if different strategies are dif uh, you know uh, yielding different uh, trades uh you need a global view to take a look at things and uh, say yes in this particular case uh maybe three strategies have all suggested buying the same script and you don't want to you know overload your risk on that just one script so you say okay the risk manager might reject two of them and say sorry we already have a position in this so you don't you know although the, the strategy suggests we take up uh, exposure we are not going to take an exposure and so on and so forth i and if the risk manager approves it you it will go to the trade manager and what the trade manager will do is it will basically place the trade but again it is very asynchronous so once it places a trade the broker api is going to turn around and maybe sometimes take even minutes if not uh, seconds to return saying yes this trade actually did get placed successfully or i couldn't do it or i had an error and and those events are you know a lot of time apart Uh, meanwhile strategies are continuously running every minute you know or every 15 seconds uh, or even sometimes there are strategies which will run only once a day so it depends but you can't have the strategies wait for the trade manager to block on a call that was made to broker api which took 5 minutes to you know fulfill so what they have to be able to do those, their work asynchronously so you need a asynchronous mechanism of communication between all these uh, you know components and that's what we are going to take a look and these are just some of them i mean the actual architecture gets a lot hairier at times but uh, these are the more important ones and then you obviously need a monitor i've skipped the monitor part of it so uh, and even the risk manager i just kept accumulator trade manager strategies and see how uh, kotlin channels and uh, kotlin actors uh, help us uh, do that right so that is the next phase actually let me let me go back here so i say okay i i declare some types uh actually before i yeah here's where i need to start so let's say i have a symbol foo again and that's the one that i'm going to use and i i i need an aggregator to sort of uh, accumulator to keep on um, taking ticks and aggregating them and then spitting out let's say one every minute 
Uh, obviously, that's not the work I'm doing here. It's a much more simplification. What it does is it uh, just keeps on sending out candles uh, at no predefined interval, uh, right? Uh, I, I've made the interval here a little, uh, I mean, uh, configurable, but this produce function actually creates a channel and then returns that channel to you. And if you look at the type of this produce candles function, it is returning a receive channel, which means this will create a channel. It will keep on pushing data to that channel and it's given you a handle uh, to the receive channel, which means on the res receiving side of things, you can take it and uh, take data and, and um, you know, uh, read from that particular channel. So, so this is where candles are sort of getting generated. Then there is one more called enricher, which takes that receive channel of a spot candle and returns another uh, channel, uh, receive channel, which will be uh, on an enriched spot candle. So you, you sort of change the data structure a little bit, added a few more things in there, uh, which is what is often you know necessary. Then you took a, uh, sorry, uh, I don't remember what aggregator was. <laughs> Aggregator was the one where, uh, you know, it, it took many candles and aggregated them into a single candle. And you're going to eventually the strategy is going to spew out an order. So you need an order type, whether the order is for buy or sell. You need an order status, which says whether it was initiated, approved, placed, partially fulfilled, filled, aborted, cancelled, so on and so forth. You, so you need to keep track of each order uh, status. And this is the order. So you have a strategy ID. What is the order type? What is the symbol? How many did you order? How many have been fulfilled? And so on and so forth. And eventually the trade manager is going to return with the order response saying this order ID, I just will. So you might have given an order for, you know, 20 lots. Uh, and uh, it turns around and say, okay, out of 20, I have filled five. And then it will come up, come back and once again say, okay, out of 20, I have filled um, I filled seven more and so, and maybe the rest of them don't ever get filled. So the trade manager always has to keep on returning order responses. And this is just the interface of a trade manager. And this is a, uh, implementation called a paper trade manager. What it does right now is this very simple logic the moment. It gets an order. It turns around and returns an order response, uh, which is going to, uh, which is going to say, I, I filled everything. But interestingly, this here is uh, going to turn around and actually not return a value. It's going to look up the underlying strategies which place the order, right? And then send it a message on the channel saying, I fulfilled your order, or, I didn't fulfill your order. So the trade manager can asynchronously and directly communicate with each of the individual strategies that are, that are running. Uh, similarly, you have a strategy and a strategy may need to risk you know, process either uh, uh, a normal message, which is your candles that are coming in, or sometimes it may need to process an order response saying this order got fulfilled or did not get fulfilled so that they can keep track of things correctly. Again, I have two very, very simple strategies. Uh, and right now, it, as soon as a message comes in, a candle comes in, it just places an order. And if it gets order response, it just prints it on the screen. And both strategies are identical. But what is interesting is, I turn around and wrap this strategy in a strategy actor. So this is actor implementation. And I give the strategy a, you know, a reference to the trade manager actor. And uh, what I am able to do is I'm, I, I take every message as it's coming in, which is mostly the candles. Uh, I process it. And if the process method says, okay, now I need you to issue an order, it will send a message to the trade manager actor saying, go process this order. If the message happens to be an order response that the trade manager sent, sent it, it will call the process order response method. If it is neither of these two, it will say, okay, this is some message I, you know, I can't process, right? So that is what uh, it is doing. So, so this is all taking normal objects and then wrapping them up either as uh, uh, objects which send messages, which are producers or consume messages, which are actors. And, and you can do all that stuff with the you know various constructs that Kotlin helps you with. 
and if it's it's sort of a erlangish kind of model obviously jvm is different than beam so it doesn't have the same kind of memory isolation and everything so you need to be a little bit more careful you could write the same object in multiple uh, uh, actors and uh, you will obviously because they are in the same jvm same memory space and like in erlang uh, you know you will be actually be simultaneously working on the same object uh, without any safety from concurrency so if you actually end up accidentally creating something like that you could be in trouble so either you have to protect your objects from simultaneous access from multiple uh, chat actors or you just make sure that every object has you know just one uh, set of actors around it whichever way you want to look at it and this is how this particular uh, what i've done is i've here set up a sort of mm, sample uh, i have wired up all the components today uh, together so initially there is there is a component which kind of creates candles then another one and these are all independent independent uh, sort of actors uh, right so they are all communicating with each other asynchronously uh, so candles is your candle producer enricher is uh, the one which is enriching those candles and then giving out enriched candles aggregator kind of uh, aggregates multiple candles into one uh, so groups them together and then i start creating strategies so i have to create a empty this is one of the places where you sort of do a mutable map because i need to give the reference of strategy actors to the trade manager so i'll fill up the map later and it's and then i instantiate a paper tra a trade manager actor so now it's going to do the trade management and then i instantiate each strategies now these strategies themselves are, are are normal op objects but that i turn them around and make them into actors using the strategy actor uh, function right which if you go there it it basically wraps it up wraps up the object with a kind of actor implementation and i create so now i have created a actor for each strategy i decide these are all the channels i will need to close when the program ends and then i get an i get this data and send it further down and you will see here where what uh, test case is this this is uh, test option d yeah test here uh, in test basic i should have given it a different name but you can see all the actors printing out those messages saying i i received this tick i dispatched this tick the strategy says okay i got this strategy two says i got this trade manager says okay i got this ordered and strategy then gets an order response and so on and so forth and it puts it all together uh, and you can see all these different actors uh, really working independently or synchronously concurrently uh, and yet you don't have to worry too much about trade safety and things like that because you kept everything isolated and uh, thus uh, and and you're not blocking anywhere most importantly i mean all the http calls end up uh you know sometimes taking a long time and sometimes even if the call succeeds the response is going to come much later of when a trade will get fulfilled so which could be minutes away so because so this allows you uh, to sort of uh, you know implement a lot of concurrency all together at the same time so yeah i think this sort of was what i wanted to talk about uh, i know it's been a li little bit uh, uh you know dense but i've left all the code out there for you to take a look at but yeah i'm open for questions dananjay thank you so much for sharing um it was dense but there was lots in there um i'm sure that that will be of benefit for somebody just seeing how you've teased out the ideas and what you were trying to achieve and what you've been able to do using kotlin so thank you for sharing your uh, experience